let's get started um next talk is going to be on maxet uh, related uh, by nina narodeskia nina yep. the floor is thanks Cody. um yes so in this talk uh, i was going to talk about uh, analysis of uh, core guided maxat uh, using uh, course and correction sets uh, this is a work we've done with uh, nikolai last year and uh, presented at uh, sat um and in the second part of the talk i was going to talk about uh, some ideas how we thought we can get some insights from this theory. This paper is a theoretical paper. So we thought maybe we can gain some ideas from the theoretical paper and uh, try to build a better solver. Um, it turns out to be very hard. Uh, uh, I did multiple attempts, uh, uh, most of them un unsuccessful, and maybe uh, the last attempt was uh, partially successful. And we are working on this now with Emir and uh, um, his students, Imka and Martin. Uh, but uh, when we went through this journey of uh, trying to build up a new solver using some intuitions from uh, our theoretical results and uh, uh, what uh, Karam was telling, uh, telling uh, us is tweaking and uh, non-science, uh, we it really his talk has really resonated because it's something that we just recently uh, went through. And uh, I thought that maybe not everyone uh, in this audience is trying to tweak the solver for the competition. So I kind of a change the talk and uh, uh, most of the talk I'll uh, I will present uh, the way how we are tweaking the solver, how we are trying to look what's going on instance by instance and see whether we can gain any insights and improve the solver. And they call this entertainment journey because Karen was saying that we are not doing science when we are picking the solver, but we are doing an entertainment. So uh, first I'll uh, present our theoretical results and only state, uh, I'll present the uh, settings and state the results, but most of the talk will be about this inter entertainment journey, how we take observations, uh, a lot of messy data and trying to tweak the solve. Uh, so um, I'll start with some background. We already had a few talks on Maxat, so very briefly. Um, the most general formulation, it's a weighted partial Maxat problem where we have um, uh, hard clauses, so clauses that we have to satisfy, and soft clauses, uh, C1 to CN. Uh, those are soft clauses. We can validate them. And every time we validate the clause, we pay a cost. We pay a cost W. So for if we validate C1, we pay cost W1. Uh, here we uh, will be focusing on a special case where all weights are one, partial maxat. So all weights are one, and because every every clause violation violation costs one, I will just remove weight. So we just count number of violation violated clause. And the goal for maxat. Uh, is to find an assignment that satisfies all hard clauses, right? Because we can't violate them, they have infinite cost, uh, and uh, violates the minimum number of soft clauses. So we want to violate as little as possible. So as people were developing solvers, uh, they came up with useful notions that uh, characterize why problem is inconsistent, why there, there is no solution with cost zero. So the first notion is unsatisfiable for, we already saw unsatisfiable cores in many talks uh, over this week. Uh, so unsatisfiable core, it's a subset of the clauses of the formula that is already unsatisfiable, no matter what the other clauses are. And uh, usually in Maxat solving, we are interested in uh, minimal, not minimum, like Marine was talking yesterday about minimum, but these are minimal unsatisfiable cores. Those you can't shrink anymore. Uh, so here, um, I put our running example. So suppose we have a problem uh, where we have uh, eight clauses from C1 to C8. And I will not spell out this clause, but suppose we also know all minimum unsatisfiable subsets of this formula. We know all minimal cores. And I show them using a uh, hypergraph notation. So now we have a uh, hypergraph where you have one, uh, every clause represents a node in this graph and every um, H represents a core. So we know that C1 and C3 together form a core. So they together can't be satisfied. And this structure, this hypergraph, we will refer in the talk as a core structure. 
So the next notion is the notion of the heating set, and uh, we will define it with respect to uh, cores. So if we say, have a set of cores, let's say in this example, a set of two cores, uh, we, uh, he heating set is a subset of cores that heats every core. So example here will be C6 and C7, because it's a subset of cores that heats every core. We have two cores in this example. So related notions are notion of a correction set. Uh, correction set is a subset of clauses such that if you remove them from the formula, it becomes satisfied. So correction, uh, correction set is the heating set of all muses, of all minimal unsatisfiable subsets. So in, in our example, we have five cores. So any correction set has to heat every single core. So here, uh, here one example of the correction set. You have C1, C4, and C6, and this will be correction set because I hit every single core, right? And um, it's well known that uh, minimum correction set, it's minimum heating set of all minimal cores. Okay, now uh, I'll talk about the uh, theoretical uh, results. So there are... Um, to, we are talking about complete Maxat. There were a few talks talking about incomplete Maxat. This is a complete Maxat uh, where you, when you uh, finish, you produce the optimal solution. And there are two classes of solvers uh, that considered to be state-of-the-art solvers. And also in the community, they considered to be like a different solver. So they work based on the different um, uh, um, ideas and algorithms are very different. And the way how they operate is very different. So we will use uh, this um, analogy, uh, one heating set by solvers. We will use, uh, we'll call it like a curious George and for the core guided, we'll uh, call it Tom because uh, to reflect how this uh, algorithm works with a formula. So you have an input formula phi and you have uh, the same formula is given to each algorithm. And the way how they solve it is very, very different. So curious George, uh, it will, take the formula, it will look at it, it will stare at it, it will gradually, step by step, retrieve the core structure of the formula. And in the end, it arrives to the optimal solution. So the way Tom is working, it's very different. It just destroys the formula. Every step uh, while the solver progress, it rewrites the formula, uh, formula becomes harder and harder, and then if we manage to terminate, we solve it, but the formula is really different from the one that you started with. That's why, um, kind of common note in the community was that these two approaches are very different. And what we were actually showing in this paper that implicitly Tom looking for the same thing as uh, Curious George is looking. So they actually retrieving the same core structure, but one is doing uh, it explicitly and another one implicitly. So to make it more clear, I, I will explain how these uh, algorithms operate. So we start with the heating base solver. We, I don't think any of the talks presented solvers like a formally. Yesterday, Jeremy gave a good talk and he outlined how they work, but I'll, I will not go to deeply into details, but to some extent, I explain how they work. So okay, how they work. Um, so we have a formula. Uh, formula has a core structure, but it's a ground truth. It's not known. Right, for the solver, all, all the solver knows it's a formula with a set of clauses. Somewhere there, there is a core structure, but in the beginning, we don't know anything about it. And also here, I will have a trace. How, while a solver progresses, it collects certain objects, and this I put in the trace. So in the beginning, um, heating set by solver, or curator solver, solver, it's um, very optimistic. It says, okay, uh, can I find a solution to satisfy all the clauses? And it asks the SAT solver, uh, an answer will be no. Why no? Because there is a core, right? So the third solver will return it. Okay, you can't satisfy all the all the clauses. There is a core C seven C eight. So you see, we, this is a ground truth, and this is my knowledge of the ground truth. So now I only know about one core. So then, the curious juror says, okay, I know about one core. Let me find the minimum heating set of this core of what I know, and maybe by luck, this is actually minimum heating set of entire formula. So it does what it can, right? See, it only knows about one core. It uh, finds a heating set. So maybe C C7, it will be heating set for this core. Uh, it removes this core from the formula and asks again the SAT solver, okay, can I now satisfy it? And the answer will be no, right? Because we, we, we have to hit every single core. 
and uh, with removing of the one clause, we couldn't do it. So the South will say no. And why? Because I give you another core. Now my knowledge a little bit more, right? So now the solver knows about two cores of the formula. So again, we do our best. We try to find the minimum heating set here and minimum heating set here will be C8, again, one, right? So we didn't improve our bound. We, we still know that it's only heating set is only that we can show of size one, it will be C8. So we try again, we remove C8 from the formula and we keep going. We will find a new core and eventually uh, it will discover the core structure. Not, not know that it doesn't need to know about all possible cores of the formula. It will discover some of them, but it will be enough for it to produce a solution or minimum heating set of this core that will be optimal solution. To recap, so what the solver is doing, it works with the original formula. It doesn't really write the formula. It just keep it as is, gradually discover the core structure. And at the end, it guarantees that minimum heating set of all discovered cores, it's optimal cost, equal to the optimal cost. Okay, this is what uh, was how uh, heating by solvers operate. So how the core guided operate? Uh, core guided uh, on the really on the surface, they operate in a very different way. So Tom starts with the formula. It doesn't try to discover core structure. It doesn't care about the core structure. At first, they all start the same. They start optimistic. Can I satisfy all the uh, all the soft clauses? The answer is no. And uh, witness would be a core. So what Tom is doing? It takes this core and it rewrites the formula. So it introduces new variables, so-called relaxation variables. It adds to the each clause in the core and it's cardinality constraints. So we, what we know, we find the core. We know that all of them can't be satisfied together, right? So we have a C1, C3 to C7, the uh, clauses, right? Clauses of the original formula. So it may be X or, or Y, right? So we have some clause, I didn't spell out uh, them. Maybe we have C1 and C2, right? And C1 equal to X and uh, C2 is not X, right? You know that it's unsatisfiable. It's a core. That's the formula that you wrote down there is that exactly one of the, of yeah exactly one exactly one of them must be uh, uh, must be one because it's a relaxation variable. Uh, I have this mean. Okay. Right. So you see that now formula is rewritten. So and we go to the next iteration. One interesting thing that happens here the course of this formula change. So this are not course of original formula are not course of this formula. This will be new course, right? So as we progress, we change the formula and then changing the course automatically change. So again, okay, this formula is satisfiable, it still contains some cores. So sad solo will give Tom the new, new core and it will relax it. Again, introducing new variables and cardinality constraints. And it keeps going on that. It keeps change the formula, course changing and introducing cardinality constraints. And then, because of what we are doing, we're relaxing the formula. And then we arrive to a formula which is satisfiable. But this formula is completely rewritten. As we progress, formula becomes harder and harder because we relax close, we introduce cardinality constraints. So high level, what is going on? Um, this solver works with, rela with relaxed formula. So it relaxes on every step. It discovers course of the relaxed formula. And when it terminates, formula is satisfiable. So and we'll find the optimal, uh, we'll find the optimal solution. As many steps we did, it's actually value of the optimal solution. But you know, uh, because everything it's a core now, it was very confusing. We have course of original formula. We have this course over the uh, written clauses that are generated as a uh, by, uh, product of, uh, of core guided solver. So we had to introduce a new notation. We called uh, formulas of relaxed uh, course meta in the paper. So those are meta. Why we call it meta? Because actually they are kind of a meta course. They contain a lot of course of the original form. Okay, so if you look at these two traces, 
that one produce so one, one algorithms produce course of original formula just revealing the structure another one produces this methods with cardinality constraints <coughs> they look very different but we had the paper earlier showing that there is also implicit traits that you can extract from the core guided solver execution and I will not go into detail because I want to talk more about practical considerations. But what it says, uh, this paper says that you can start from this trace and produce somewhat equivalent trace. We didn't know this equivalent, but now we know. But so we can produce a trace in terms of the course of original formula. So it's a procedure that shows how from this meta core generate course of original formula. So we already knew that you can go from metas to the course of original formula. So what then uh, the main result of the paper? We look at this course. We know that course that core um, heating set solver generator nice. They have this property on the heating set, uh, but we don't know what this implicit uh, trace course, how good they are. They generate some course, how good this course are. So we decided to an analyze properties of this generated course. And we were focusing on uh, minimum heating set. The main result of the paper says that if you get this old course that we generated as an implicit trace and compute the minimum heating set of it, it's actually minimum heating set equal to the optimal solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, question. Was there some reason you picked the first core for Tom to be different from the first core for him? No, it doesn't matter. It was just easier for George. me to. Okay. It, it's worse for any execution. Okay. It's a very kind of messy proof, but it uh, says that in any execution, if you collect this meta course and we have a procedure how to go from meta course to course of original formula, at the end, if you collect all of them, if you find the minimum heating set, it will be um, equal minimum heating set, size of the minimum heating set equal to the optimal solution. Right, so this was intuition. Uh, this was actually what Karen called, I guess, science. So we, we did prove it. But this is not our kind of final goal. Our final goal is to um, build the solver. So even in the paper, we discussed how these results can, first of all, why the result is interesting and how we can maybe build a better solver. So why result is interesting? So this is the first result that shows that actually the solvers internally, they're not that much different. Both of them, are they explicitly or implicitly work on the core structure, on the core structure of original formula, and they extract very good cores. And also we pointed out that the, um, this course you generate because when a core guided solver stopped, okay, you have an optimal solution, but what's the proof? If we can generate the course that I just described, it can be alternative certificate to uh, show why optimal cost. You know, it will be certificate for the optimal cost, right? Because all of them are course of original formula and minimum heating set of them equals to, to this way. Right, so what, now we're going more to practical considerations. Uh, so we thought, okay, if we have this insight that uh, these solvers all generate cores, they all work with the core structure of the formula, maybe we can somehow, you know, build a hybrid solver. We can run one solver for some time, maybe, maybe it's stuck at some point. We get all the cores that it produced, give it to a different solver, and maybe exchange between them. So now we're going on our entertainment journey of struggling to build the solver. And, uh, and then we, we still, we don't have a best performing solver out of this results. So, okay, so let's start like the very basic things to try. You start with a heating set solver, run it for some time, you arrive to some bound. Maybe solver can't progress anymore. You collect all the cores that we know by this point, give it somehow to core guided solver. And hopefully you could start from the low bound key. How to do it? This was our research question is actually not very clear. And we even simplify problem even more. So let's not forget about heating set solver. Let's imagine we have a core generation oracle. Someone in Oracle gives you core structure or approximation of the core structure. Can you take advantage of it? So what we did, we ran, uh, we took instances from last year uh, Maxat evaluation. Mati doesn't allow me to say competition. So we have to say evaluation. <laughs> So, yes. so from, from uh, SAT evaluation and for, for each instance, we, uh, for, we only were looking for unweighted one just purely because we don't have resources. Uh, and um, we run a core extraction procedure, greedy, heavily randomized 
core destruction procedure for six hours. And this was our core generation oracle. And then we have for each instance, now we have a lot of cores of original formula. Can we, can we now make a solver somehow take advantage of this course? So we run for six hours on each instance. We collect all the cores. We minimize them. But procedure to minimize the course, it's, it's a heuristic. So in the, in the end, we don't know whether the course are minimal or not. And the results are noisy, mostly because uh, they were not intended. You know, the, we thought it uh, when I was doing it as it's for internal use, but we talked to Emir uh, uh, yesterday, and we thought maybe we can make it public so people also work on it. Um, so the goal is, can we learn something from the core structure? And note that this results are solvers independent. So it doesn't matter. We just look at the instance core structure, try to observe something, and maybe based on these observations, uh, improve the solver. So we'll have um, uh, two types of observations. The first uh, type of observation is a, a instance level observation. So this is the first instance that I'll show. Actually, I will be always showing two instances from the same family. And this is a histogram. So on the... Um, X axis we show core size. So I generate a lot of cores. Here I, I show like in each uh, each um, histogram will correspond to core of certain size. So here cores of size 25. And uh, on the y axis I show how many cores are of this size. Is it clear? Because we'll be using histogram, right? So uh, and on top um, for for two instances from the same family. Uh, I just give some statistics, uh, like uh, number of variables, number of clauses, number of hard clauses, number of variables, number of soft clauses in this formula. And for the reference, I give you time to solve for a good solver, not the best solver there, but a pretty good solver. Okay, so if you have instance like that, you generated this course and uh, you have this observation. So all the course that are heuristically were generated of size of the same size, and there are a lot of them. Would you be able to conclude something about this instant? Right, so what does it mean? We have 25 soft clauses. Every time I sample, we have, sorry, we have 55, we have 55 soft clauses, right? And every time, seem, it seems to be, right? Because it's heuristic uh, how we generate core, we sample 25 of them, maybe four oh, and so on, so on, 25. I don't know what some number, 50. There are, but there are 25 of them. And this is a core. Any ideas what this, what this formula? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you have a cardinality constraint yes. hiding in there, but I have a question. So, I mean, what cores you're when you're extracting these cores? Should I think of you as as running like some kind of implicit hitting sets all? Because no, which cores no. you're going to see is going to depend on which assumptions you run exactly. with. Exactly. No? So, and you didn't tell us very, this, or did you? I didn't use implicit hitting set for purpose because I wanted to have a good. Um, good grasp what the core structure overall. I don't know what uh, implicit hit is sent. But how are you going to get different core? I mean, you need some assumptions for your solver, no? So, yes. So I randomize assumptions. Uh, ah, right I, uh, okay. It's a very simple, greedy, heavily randomized algorithm. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I ensure that every time if I manage to generate a core, it's a new core. Okay, fair enough. But, uh, yes. This is the total number of cores extracted, right? It's not it's, in it, any way minimized. It's not like we need this many cores to... to we, no, we don't try to... Uh, now we're just analyzing mm -hmm. what we get. So in six hours, actually there was six or eight, but for a long time I ran this uh, greedy procedure, greedy randomized procedure to generate this core. By no means it's all cores. It's just some big sample. But if you have 200,000 200, cores of the same size, randomly kind of sample, it might already suggest something. Right, yes, and this actually, right, because if you look at the title of this benchmark, this is a benchmark name, you see, at most 24 out of 25. Uh, so we can, of course, go and try to hope that benchmark names gives us hints, which is, <laughs> I don't think, but um, also, like, even if it's, uh, 
what uh, Karam referred as tweaking or kind of a uh, non-science non entertainment, it actually can uh, give you some you know, intuitions. And I think it's very similar to what Jeremy suggested in, uh, in his paper a few years ago, right? He, he, he has a, he didn't, in a different way, but I think conception is exactly the same. So it, what the, my point is, and you probably were also staring at benchmarks, right? At this one, actually. Oh, even at this one. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So I think it's a counterexample to what Karen was saying that just <laughs> to, uh, staring at data and in instance by instance trying to tune us over doesn't give you uh, good intuition. But you see, sometimes uh, they're actually quite interesting. Okay, so the next uh, instance, uh, all plots in the first block will be the same. So we have core sizes on the x axis and uh, number of cores of this size on the y-axis. So um, what to observe here? Uh, okay, so this is what I'm telling now. It's not a, by any means a ground truth or anything. It just as a human or solo developer observations, uh, you might have others. So it was the one that I observed. So first of all, let's look at this instance. So the number of, there are two instances. There are two instances from the same class. So number of variables about the same. Number of clauses, they're slightly different, but it's million. So um, I would say they're not that much different. And uh, number of soft clauses about the same. But also notice the time to solve the, uh, this instance is very, very different, right? So one, you can solve the orange one, you can solve almost in no time. And the another one takes um, quite a bit of time, it's time and seconds, time to solve. And my point here is that looking at uh, variables and number of clauses that um, Karen presented a uh, few days ago as a, you know, as some statistics that we can keep track of uh, instances and uh, see how different solos perform, but then it's not sufficient, at least for Maxat, because given two instances that have about this, I'm not sure about the um, primal graph, maybe graphs can be different, but I, I, I doubt that they're too much different. But if you look at the number of cores, you can clearly see that one problem most likely will be harder than another. So you see this blue problem has way more cores of uh, size six, way more cores of size seven and eight. So just by looking at the structure, you, of the course, or the basic statistic of the course, you can get some insights uh, on um, how, how difficult this problem is. Um, why I put this instance that actually for those instances, knowing that this course in advance improves the solver. So for those instances, I could get an improvement. Why? Because core sizes are small. But we'll talk about core sizes later. Okay, number three. So again, it's two instances, maybe the same instance, but per, per, permuted from this family. Look, the, those are very small. Number of variables, number of clauses, and number of solves. And it's either times out or uh, can solve it, or can solve it very close to the timeout. And look at the core structure. So do you think this, pro the, for those who are familiar with core guided, uh, do you think it's a hard problem for core guided or easy? Look, I think the key see, uh, here is to look at the core sizes. You know, if cores are large, what does it mean that when you relax the core, you will have introduced very large cardinality constraints? So just knowing that there are so many cores and most of them are somewhat larger cores, hints that uh, for um, core guided solver, it will be tough instance. And if we go to even more extreme like that, it's another instance, you see the core sizes is, uh, uh, 400 goes for so even without running a solver, I can tell you that uh, solver will never terminate on this instance because cores are gigantic, and I also know that um, minimum heating set of this course is large, more than 100. So it's kind of it's a useful. It's not as nice as this uh, abstract course idea or cardinality constraints that you can take. Uh, you can just observe and uh, maybe use to improve uh, your solver here. You just look at it. Okay, there are, there are large cores and they're not easy. And what to do with it? 
you can only have a, like a hybrid. You have an idea what to do with it. <laughs> no, I'm just curious. Is it like, would you say it's a general phenomenon if you have like, many large cores that that would be like it, based on your experience where implicit hitting set would shine for instance compared to core gathering? i don't know whether implicit set, uh, set uh, will shine and this problem i i don't know actually i, I don't have intuition i i doubt it's also very much depends what the minimum heating set of this course if it's high i'm not even sure that heating set will i think no one solves this instance in the competition because minimum heating set of this course it's high it's 100 and i, I don't know it's low bound, this minimum heating set, slow bound on the optimal solution. Optimal solution is even high. So with such a huge number of large cores, I, uh, heating set will not be able to solve it. But you're saying at least you, you believe that like core guided will die simply because, yeah, because core of the number of die. variables that you're... Very quickly, yes. It will it will progress a little bit in the day. It can't, it can't do 100 steps, 100 relaxation with cores, because cores will size grow. This is a re course of original formula. Right, because when you start doing relaxation, scores become even larger. Yep. Yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, then in this case, it's probably unit clauses. So all, all the soft clauses are unit clauses. It looks like every soft clause it, it has a unique one of the unique variable. I mean, there's a one to one correspondence. Yes, <laughs> yes. So then it means that all soft clauses are unit clauses, unit. Okay. Right, uh, one more example. Um, okay, so another instance, uh, why uh, this is instance is very large. So number of variables is large, number of clauses is large, not that many softs. Um, and timed out. So solver times out. But you see that we, we, we found a lot of cores and they have small size. So for, for these instances, we also managed to, you know, it's a question whether you can improve the solver knowing in advance what the core, core structure is or understand at least something there. So here, because all cores are small, initial course, so you can traverse them in a certain order, like again, it's a heuristic, but you can improve, you can solve this instance if knowing this core structure in advance and expo exploiting it. But there is nothing general here. You just look at it and uh, see what, uh, what you can do. Okay, so another thing, it's kind of a, um, I would say pathological case. So, um, Again, we have two instances from the same family uh, and all cores of size one, all cores that we found of size one. So it means that this formula, even all the cores in this formula are of size one, unit cores. So it means that I'm not even sure whether such instance is a good candidate for Maxat evaluation because it's a competition of the SAT solvers, right? You find one unit core, you relax it, you find the new core, core you remove it. Course, you need course not relax, they're kind of removed from the formula. So if you know that you have all the course of, of uh, size one, all the course a unit in this sampling procedure, maybe it can be removed from the SAT, uh, MAXAT evaluation because it's not, you don't need anything from MAXAT or from MAXAT algorithms to solve this problem. You just need a very fast uh, SAT solver. And, the solver who will win on, on this type of instances will be the ones that have a better SAT solver. Right, um, another example. So it's kind of an example showing that all this uh, analysis that I was uh, talking about can be completely misleading. Uh, so we have a, uh, another family, I don't know what it means, like two, two, um, two instances. Pretty small, the number of variables, uh, small number of causes, number of source, uh, soft. And um, we run the sampling, you know, this uh, greedy sampling procedure of this course, it's actually, it's a blind procedure. It gives a formula and it generates whatever. Uh, and we obtain the result that all the cores that you find were of size three, but look how many of them. For example, for, for, for this uh, 
um, orange instance, there are about um, 3,000 something uh, cores. But actually, what's going on? Look at this number of clauses. It's exactly the number, or almost close to the number of clauses. What it means that you have a lot of hard clauses that contains only soft. Um, so it also all soft clauses are units. So it means that all the hard clauses are effectively coarse. So you're just recreating the instance. You, you, you can't do this. This is a wasted effort, right? Because all what, 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 all what you recreated, it's hard uh, with this course, it's a hard uh, clause of the original formula. So you see this analysis and we try to, uh, try to think, okay, so we, we learned something. We, when all course of the same size, we, we can make some conclusions. Not always the case. Here it's useless because we just recreated the formula. We didn't learn anything new. Okay, so I have uh, five minutes. I have some time. Um, so the next set of observation is a kind of competition level observation. So we look at the all instances of the competition and see how, uh, try to analyze overall, like how good our core generation procedure, like uh, is it, um, was it maybe useful? So we actually filter out all, all instances that are sold by a reasonably good solver in uh, 600 seconds. So we filtered out all the easy instances. Right. Um, so what we're showing here, we're showing a plot on um, X axis. We have number of cores that we found per instance. And on Y axis, we show average core size for this instance. It's truncated. It's actually, um, there are um, few instances that have very large average size, like uh, 50,000, so I truncated. So what one point means? One point means that there is an instance in the uh, last year evaluation that we managed to find maybe like 80,000 cores and average size of this course was um, about 100, uh, 120, I guess. So, the meaning, meaning of the point, how many cores we found for this instance and uh, average size of the, of the course. So there are a few observations here. So there are, very few instances that we can generate a huge number of cores, and usually when the, the core size is small. If there is a huge number of instances that we have like a less than uh, uh, 100,000 cores generated, and again, the size is small, and very few uh, that have very large core sizes. And this partially explains why core guided are uh, somewhat effective on these instances, because uh, dealing with large cores is very hard for it, and there are not that many. There are not that many instances that by the sampling procedure, of course, we found that um, core size is large. Right. Um, another um, point that we wanted to understand how good is this core structure? So what, what I mean, so again, I made up this notion of goodness. What does it mean? But what do I mean by it? So let's say this is our core structure. And if um, our core enumeration procedure, our Oracle only found this course, it's bad, right? Because uh, we hope to find to have a good understanding of the, all the course landscape. Finding this course will be okay, but uh, it's not very useful because uh, they all overlap all on one variable, so heating set is one here. So, so what, what this plot shows? So here on the X, do I have it? Okay, don't. So on the x-axis, I show what is the best low bound that core guided uh, solver could find in one hour. And on the uh, y-axis, it's a minimum, it's the size of the mean heating set of the core that they found. So what this point means? So in this point means that if I run good solver for uh, one hour, I can get to the low bound, which is maybe 80. But if I look at all the cores that I found, the minimum heating set of this course is more than 100. Right, so even running the best solver for a long time will not even get me to the point. Okay, this is not clear. I look at Jacobin. <laughs> okay, we have this course. We can find the minimum heating set of them. This will be low bound of the optimal cost. So if I look at, at all the course from this instance that I generate, it low bound is 110. So what is my goal, a final goal? If I know that low bound already 110, I would like to hot start somehow knowing all that 
hot start core guided solo with this low bond. But actually, it's very hard. Well, um, I don't know, again, succeed to do. And we know that if we just run it on its own, it will not even get there. It will not even get to 100, it will be at 90. And look at this instance. So this is an instance, I think it's one that we saw before. This instance was a large course. So you have a lot of large cores and uh, you need a lot of um, relaxation. So you need at least 100 something relaxation points to hit them then for court guided you see it doesn't go anyway it stops less at less than 100 points right so okay so to conclude you'll probably already notice that it's a quite messy process to go through all these statistics and trying to understand uh, what uh, looking at the instance and trying to understand what the properties are what we can learn from this data and whether we can improve the solve. But uh, I think, I hope I convince you that cores are actually very important objects. And uh, it, was, it was known before that uh, order in which we find this course matter. We know that the, for the solvers, it's important. Uh, so if you find the right order, that, there is no definition of the right order, but if th there is somewhere a good order, uh, if you can find it, solver is much faster. Uh, in this work, we show that uh, both classes of solvers, uh, they explicitly or implicitly generate this core structure. And uh, also we know that obtaining all of them, it's just infeasible. There can be exponential number of them, it's just gigantic. So the best thing we can do is sum. Um, so the question, if we have some time for the discussion, maybe a few, few minutes we have, like I wanted to um, pose it, um, like if cores are so important objects, shouldn't we study them as a you know as a standalone um, notion, right? Should we study this uh, core structure? Maybe we, we can't get the all cores, but we can get approximation. And uh, by studying the structure, improve the solvers, or maybe even first understand what the property of the instances, and then improve the solver. So what what do they uh, what do people think? It's not necessarily people who are doing max uh, max sad. It's also uh, sad people. Uh, because for unsatisfiable instances, maybe it's also useful to understand why formula is hard by generating many, many unsatisfiable cores. And then it will also might tell you something about uh, whether actually uh, hardness of the problem is hidden. So any opinions on that? No, how much is left? One minute. Okay, so any opinions on that? Okay, do people agree that uh, it's important to study core structure? Yes. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so at least when we have one yes, that's good. And Mati runs competition, so. <laughs> well, <evaluation. laughs> oh, I'm sorry. We should cut it out from the recording. Evaluation. <laughs> yeah. A small remark that in uh, well other work we've been doing, uh, we're interested in finding cores with specific properties. So this comes from um, originally from explaining constraint programming instances, and we're searching actively for cores that have certain properties. So right. maybe it can be relevant here as well. Yeah, yeah. I guess certain properties is important, but I also think knowing the entire landscape is also important. A very naive and online question, not related even to Maxat. You could ask, like, for the SAT competition, you could you could ask for unsatisfiable instances about the core set and the you know, distribution of cores, and if that somehow correlates to you know the the formulas that we solve quickly, do they have lots of cores or yeah. like or, or? Yes, this is what they thought also, right? That for SAT, when you find SAT instances, uh, looking at the core structure, give you some insights about. Uh, problem. Um, what do you think? Because uh, the cores that you uh, considered were more or less greedily obtained. Um, do you think it's worth spending more efforts into getting kind of high quality cores? Maybe yes. looking at DRAD proofs uh, along the lines uh, Marine talked yesterday? It's definitely good to have uh, minimal cores. 
you definitely uh, have uh, I don't know whether it's always good to have like a smaller scores, right? Because maybe it only describes one part of the inconsistency and we might have uh, other parts which have very large core, but it's definitely good to have a minimal one. So maybe it will help to minimize the core. And he, I think he was doing this minimization, but he was looking for the minimum, right? But the minimality definitely helps because it gives you much clearer picture, right? Because otherwise all those cores gigantic, you can't say much. Just to remark that I have no idea what's a high quality core that Stefan referred to. <laughs> For example, we have unit core. Well, okay. Like all, all small disjoint cores, these are always good and they're good for uh, finding uh, uh, at most one. So yeah, everything is vague here. It's just yeah, for us course. to decide. Right. I, know. I just wanted to say that, right? So it's, it's, we don't even sort of know what we want to find. That's why now we're trying to find everything we can. Okay, so we have to finish, right? Yes, uh, sorry, we have to finish. So, okay, uh, we won't go about the tweaking. Another question? Ah, we have a question, okay. So, um, in model checking, there are algorithms which are based on the on course, like abstraction refinement. Mm -hmm. So you find the core and then you continue with that core, mm -hmm. but it's not it's not immediately clear which core is is the best. Like you, you can determine it maybe empirically, but but I don't think like being the best in this setting is super uh, super important because we, we have to look at to, to solve Maxat, you have to relax all the cores, good and bad, right? Uh, yeah, we can discuss offline. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's thank Nina twice.